Welcome everybody to the Real Deals Podcast, one of the top ranked real estate investing podcasts for the last seven years. This is the place to be for investing strategies you can actually use, expert interviews, and of course, some good old fashioned entertainment. Now, here's your host for the show, Elliot, the REI guy, Smith. on Real Deals Podcast. Hopefully you guys liked that show last week. I thought it was super good. If you haven't listened to it, go back and take a listen. I was Jared Holland out of Seattle, Washington. So this week's a little bit differently. I had a, cl- a guy reach out to me on Instagram. As I've done before, I bring him on the show. Some of these guys that I feel like might be a good fit. He had reached out to us a while ago about possibly getting on and using Call Magic, but he lived in Redding, California, and the market was just too small for us to be effective. And we tell people that all the time. Even in my market with the population that I have, it's just sometimes too small in Tri-Cities to use a full caller all the time. So I turn it on, I turn it off, I turn it on and back on and off. So I said, how about I help you? You We can help you with like being more targeted on your marketing piece. And a lot of this is the stuff that I learned back in the day from Tucker, actually. Tucker works in two zip codes. He's been very targeted. His list is very small. And this is more for his new construction side in Lake Oswego. He did market to a large list in Portland, but once he started getting more into new construction stuff, he ended up moving back into staying in two prime zip codes and having only little pockets. So his list was probably sub 800 people. So we go down a couple different paths, but I really break down how you market in his market. And I use Redding, California as an example. We, uh, we talked about sniper marketing. We talked about machine gun marketing. We talked about if he wanted to get very nitty gritty into only a few zip codes and what I would do there. We talked about building a driving for dollars list and how we would do that. We talked about using deal machine driving for dollars app. And we also talked about using the driving for dollars app as they both serve their own purpose. So I think you guys are going to really like this episode this week. I tried something a little bit different with the intros. When I'm looking at what people are listening to, you guys always Listen to me talk in the first part, but then you guys skip through like the ads, which I do as well. And I totally understand that. But anyway, you know what's coming. It's a little quick, real quick update on me since I didn't talk about it last week. We are getting ready to close on the 31 unit. We are super pumped on our 32 unit that we bought back in November last year. We have the exterior all done. We have some of the units done and we signed our first lease for 1275 and a two bedroom, one bath. Why that matters. We had projected on our what we thought it would rent for when we fixed it up, eleven twenty five. That is a hundred and fifty dollars difference. It goes straight to the bottom line. If you figure that we have twenty two two bedrooms and we have ten one bedrooms, if you figure it out with just a hundred dollars extra for the one bedrooms and one hundred fifty dollars extra for the two two one bed two bedrooms one bath, that and that's just saying. If the rents stay like this, they're still increasing. So it could be higher. Right there alone, that adds $960,000 to our value of our building at a five cap, which a five cap is very conservative. That is the power of multifamily. And it is so amazing. So anyway, guys, life's looking good for me in the business side. As I talked back in December, I started struggling with some mental health stuff. And it's, sometimes it's hard. I actually got a diagnosis. And I started getting off on some off some medication and got on some other medication. And it's just kind of been a tough time for me. And that's a lot of the reason why I've been a little inconsistent. I just haven't been all there to like go rah, rah and just really get after this. So trying to maintain the business, maintain everything I have. Taking a week, I'm going to Palm Springs. I kind of be by myself. My son's going down there to hang out with my birth mom. I have my own place that we're staying at. They're staying at their place and I'm staying at my place. So really going to get some sun and try to spend some time reading, try to do some of the things that I know I need to do and try to get a good sleep pattern going and just try to get back into some sense of level levelness, I guess, if that makes sense. So guys, people can be doing a lot of really cool things. You could follow me on Instagram and say, hey, look, all these cool things I'm doing. I have these this guy that runs my Instagram and he talks and puts all this stuff out there and all these things. It looks really rosy and looks like I have it all together. That's everybody. People can make themselves look really good. And I struggle with it as well, where I'm like, this guy is doing all these cool things. Or, man, I just 
can't get there. I'm just doing my first flip. And this guy's already, he's younger than me. He's doing more flips. We all start where we start and we all have our own struggles. So if you've been holding back on real estate, get started today. It's not going to be easy, but it's well worth it. If you're struggling with something, reach out to somebody, reach out to me. If you, if you're struggling with something mental health wise, I can relate and I have compassion, but life can get better. And at the end of the day, we're all fighting to just stay alive, make more money and be happy. There's a lot of people in this world that have it a lot worse than us. And I'm very thankful for every single one of you guys that listen and tune in, even if my release dates kind of go sporadic and all my support I get on Instagram, it really means the world to me. And I'm all in every single day. I'm not perfect and I have hard days, but I always try to be better and I hope you do as well. So keep your heads up, get after it and uh, go make some stuff happen. All right, guys, have a great week. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, Do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. Dude, I can't believe that she's like self-managing those units. That's insane. So yeah, so she's, we have 98 under management currently. She was like, I have nothing better to do. I'm going to jump on these. I kind of pushed her, like that was always her role. And then we just went crazy. And so she was doing it, but we have a, she has a full-time property manager underneath her. She'll probably get an assistant here soon full-time property maintenance. She's been running project management though. That's been kind of hard for her. And so we're actually hiring a superintendent right now. They should be offering a job to somebody tomorrow, I think. And so we're hiring underneath her, but she's the one that has to do these things because I can't, I mean, I physically, I mentally can't do those things. I just, I'm not good at them. I can tee up. So like my job is to drive revenue and find deals. And her job has always been to put them back together and manage our finances. And I raise right. money. And so it just happened to be, I found some big deals, but we also have a partner in Fort Holmes. You check his houses out. He's got a ton of stuff in Kirkland, Washington. He's got like 17 employees right now, 120 million being under construction, being built out in his pipeline. So he's our partner. So he's been helping her quite a bit too, with all this stuff, like mm-hmm. teaching her how to run a business. And so They've been doing interviews together and a perfect example. They had a guy that the resume looked really good, older guy, done big, big projects. And so he was trying to relocate back. And Chris is like, I'd hire him. Greg's like, here's why I wouldn't. Guys that have been doing 400 unit apartments or working for big developers, we need this guy to like get bids, like a project manager. They don't want to do that. Or they don't even know how to do that because they haven't had to. So like really good experience from his part to help push her in the right direction. Got it. So, man, that's such a lot, dude. I mean, like for me, like I'm like feeling overwhelmed trying to rent out our guest house, <laughs> like right now, you know. So I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean you don't have a bunch of real other deals going on, and it's outside your yeah. comfort zone, right? Yeah. So okay, There's let's so talk about detail, man. What's that? There's just so much detail. It's just so many interactions with so many people. So it's crazy. This business is crazy. Like right now, my stress is trying to get money to close on this. Like. We need a million and a half dollars in 10 days. I mean, we can close on it, but like not because of me, because of Greg, but it's going to put us in a, him in a tight spot. And so we're like offering 
NESDA at like 14% for 18 months, 6% paid uh, quarterly, and then six total, like for the year. So it's a 6% is paid until, and then we catch up the rest because it's going to be vacant. We don't want to be making 14% annualized payments for like a million and a half dollars. Well, I started out because myself, Greg has been able to raise money. He's got like 15 million at four to 6% non-recordable money. He doesn't have to lean it. doesn't have to be leaned. And I'm like, dude, if you already have 15 million, we can get it at 6%. I kept saying, no, we're not gonna do that. So I wasted a bunch of time. Well, his guys can't do it. He doesn't have any buddies that can do it because that's a relationship to be built with no leanable debt. Well, now now we're behind the gun. So anyway, so if you know anybody, pay your point. Referral fee. Sure thing, man. So, so yeah, hey. I mean, like for me, like what I really need help with is just kind of getting going. Like I've had a few deals here and there as far as like flips or I'm in the middle of uh, renovating a triplex. Nice. And uh, so we picked that up. It was just like an on-market deal. Only had like one picture was listed super low. And I was like, that's a crazy deal. So I just offered them full price and they took it. So down here, I mean, like it, it went, for, it was listed for like 175,000. Okay. And rents were like 400, 450 each per unit. And so I just offered them full price. They took it right away. And then basically negotiated through escrow, like another 25,000 off. We got it down to like 150,000. Nice. But yeah. So we're, we close on it. We've got like hundred K to work with on the budget to try and get it done. So we're just in the middle of that. Everything's taking a lot longer than I really anticipated. It honest. always does. It yeah. always does. Especially it's right still, now with like, all the, it's nothing like, like the scale of what you're talking about, like in the percentages that you're talking about, but you know, like I think our interest rates like eight or 9% interest only. And it's, and so I'm like, man, that's like 1900 a month. That's going out. The units are empty. It's been five months. And we only have like two out of like 10 of 10 of the parts of the project that need to get done. And it just sucks because everything just takes forever. Especially now with the, you know, windows are six to seven months out. You got that materials. So, okay. We did roof, we did windows. We're in the middle of like HVACs going in mini splits. And I'm like getting all these bids from people. And I'm like, how much for a mini split? Like we put mini splits in our guest house like seven years ago for a couple grand. And now like per unit, they want like seven or eight grand per unit. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, it's just crazy. So then like, I, I do waste some time like trying to find better deals, but at some point it's diminishing returns on trying to get discounts for projects. Right. So. Yeah. And then what, unless then what kind of workmanship are you getting? You always want to go that middle of the road guy. Usually you don't want to go the cheapest guy. You don't need yeah. to go the most expensive guy that's going to all homeowners, but you got to find him. And then he's got to have availability. Yeah. And that's the hard part. And like I had a guy lined up, it was a great deal. And then all of a sudden he got COVID and just quit responding and didn't tell me when he'd be back. And so I was like, awesome. You got a better offer. Play catch up. So yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at on that project. And we're trying to finish those up before we start going inside to renovate the insides. But but yeah, I'm definitely feeling that pressure because I want to like, you know, finish the project, refinance, get it restabilized. Okay. So tell me a little bit about like, you've been a realtor, you said 15 years. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? What market are you in exactly? Uh, Northern California. So okay. Which city? Cal. We're in Redding specifically. Yeah. Redding, okay. And, and so about uh, two and a half hours north of Sacramento. And you are been a realtor 15 years. What kind of volume are you doing? As far as like myself, I kind of go like, I'd say average like 30 houses a year for myself. I own my own brokerage that we started seven years ago. So there's about 14 agents that are a part of the brokerage here. Okay. Um, it's called nice. Upward, Upward Realty. So, nice. yeah. So you're so making money last then. Last year, we did about 120 houses, 120 units. Nice. So you're nice. making money though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So the problem we had when we talked before about doing the call center was there's only 91,000 people and there's only right. 25,000 houses. We thought we'd burn through it too quick and it just didn't seem like it'd be a good fit. Yep. Which, as we decided to get back on the phone today, I still believe that opinion. Right. But and so we're, what we're doing today is we're talking about, okay, you want to buy houses, you want to go off market. How do I do it? Right. What's the best bang yeah. for your buck time consuming. How do you do that? And so I figured yeah, I do that. And I would, you know, guys, you're listening to this, I'm recording it so then I can share it with you guys. So everybody has the same advice. So yeah. All right. Which is great. I mean, like for me, it's like, I've had a few deals like here and there, but like, really I want to create more consistency for deal flow. So, okay. So we're going to go over direct mail. There's three, there's things that can work really well for you. Cold calling can work well for you, but not as a, 
as a machine gun type like we perform. So hiring a good cold caller that can also double as a leads manager. And I can help point that in that right direction. Or I can also, we, we have leads managers that we can provide. That person that's making single line dials, more targeted dials to people. And having, instead of having like a three and a quarter, half minute conversation, a four minute conversation, like our cold callers would, they would have maybe can be available to have a five to 10 minute conversation on the front end because they know more, they have more information and they can present themselves as they're local, right? As they, they know Reading, they know that if you watch Sons of Anarchy, that's where this was based out of, right? All they can talk about the stuff in Reading itself, right? Mm-hmm. And the nice thing is they can also double, as you said before, you're stressed with what you're doing. So you're probably busy not wanting to answer the phone calls yourself. They can also be that front person to answer incoming calls from like direct mail. And then they can also follow up with leads. They just are a leads manager. And then if it's a retail kind of lead, they can push them to whoever your agents are that you would push the retail leads to. They can push them to you to get underwrote. And maybe they're not a salesperson, but then you can take it off and take the sales side of it once it's a viable lead to go work or walk, right? Got so it. I have that. You're saying that like you have people like that or like there's, that's like the type of person that you, I would need to get. We, we do sell leads managers from Egypt that are really good. We also sell, we have acquisitions guys, but I don't, we're not ready there yet. And I don't think that's what I would do in this situation at this point in time, because you need to learn this process more than first. Sure. Um, we can talk with Cole, like, and I, and I would want to make sure it's the right person. Worst case, you find somebody at $15 an hour on Upwork that can be, they don't have to be local, right? They can be local, but they don't have to be. So you just find them on Upwork. A lot of times you'll find these stay at home moms are really good, but they don't have, and they don't have kids from nine to three, you know, in their area. So they want to do something and they can be very good and they just want to make some extra money. So that's uh, preferably English is their first language and they're very competent, but our Egyptians, you can't tell that their English is not their first language and they can be trained on the area. But with how much you have going on, I think that's necessary is what I would say first. Not saying you have to, you can start doing it for a little while, but that's what I would do. If you want to start with the cold calling route, that's, that's definitely would be what my thought would be. So the next to be thing able would to be, like handle the volume. Is that what you're saying? Because like because it's lower inbound. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not, well, you, we would, you could level lay on layer on direct mail, but what we're going to talk about is we're going to be more strategic on who we're marketing to. Because if you only have 25,000, like you said, I think on the thing, 25,000 yeah, yeah. single family residences, how many of those are ones that you would actually buy, right? So what kind of list do we need to get? What kind of list do we need to build? I'm going to yeah. recommend a driving for dollars list is what I think is the best bang for your buck. And then you basically say, okay, we build this list. And then we put a plan together really for that. And like then, and I kind of very similar to, we were talking about our gift, my giftology stuff, Yeah. depending on who that person is is how much I'm willing to spend per that gift. Right. Like, so if they're, they're important, but they're not like, I need them. It's not super important. That gift's going to cost maybe a hundred dollars. But if it's like that developer guy, that gift costs a lot more. Right. So we kind of make that list. And then depending on how many we have, we bracket them. And in our multifamily, we call it our Norman list. So we bracketed all our multifamily leads from one to five. Number ones were our Normans. And those were, basically guys that are 60 to 80 years old, they've owned the property for 20 plus years and they have little to no debt on the property. Okay. So that's like an old guy that I just want to go be friends with because he's going to sell sooner than later. And I want to be the guy he's talking to. Got it. Um, And then twos would be a little bit looser criteria. Threes would be like loose. Fours are like, ah, this could be a long shot. And then fives were like, take off the list. And then each level it's different type of marketing per spend per lead. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. And so it's just, a, a you're not la- like mailing everybody that's on the list, like one through five, like not one. No, not list. on that one through five list. Yeah. Like I will mail everybody on like the one through four. Let's say if this was single family, if it was everybody one through four, I would mail everybody with like a realtor letter or a offer postcard or something like that. But then my ones are going to get like handwritten with like maybe a grab, uh, something, a grab, attention grabber in there. I'll tell you what we do offline. I don't want that out there. And then number two is we get like a handwritten letter. And these are like, we'll build custom envelopes ourselves for the time of the year to our area. It's pretty 
easy to do online. And then we have open letter marketing. We can send the envelopes to open letter marketing and they can, uh, then they can write the handwritten letters because they have machines and their cost is equal, pretty reasonable. We used to have a handwriting machine back in the day, but then it just was a pain in the envelope stuffer, handwriting machine. It was a pain in the ass. Oh, so you're doing it all in-house. Yeah, at one point. And then we switched everything to open letter and they, it doesn't, it actually, for save our time, it costs less than what's our, what our time's now worth right. and the quality is better. And I, I can make a phone call and it's done next week. So, and then they'll ship stuff to me, like the ones that we put a grabber in there, they'll ship it to me. We can have a, I have a 12 or 13 year old, just put whatever we put in there, seal them up and I pay them some cash. And so then those, so then they, they get certain levels and then they all have a mailing sequence. So like the sequence goes, if you're in Norman, it's handwritten with the thing in there. A next sequence was handwritten follow-up, handwritten postcard, then a realtor letter, um, which is basically a realtor, which is good for you is, hey, Daniel Elliott Smith here. I'm a realtor at Upward yeah. Upward Realty. This is not a solicitation to list your home, but I have a, in, I have a cash buyer that's interested in buying your property. Are you interested in receiving a cash offer? I'd be happy to talk to you you hit a totally separate part of that list. Some brokers don't want to do it because sometimes they don't, I don't, some of them don't like it as much, but it works really well. And that, that list, when we mail it always gets good traction. If you have a good agent, they can do it. And we've always, you know, we always buy houses off that list, off that letter. Um, and it just seems like when you're talking to these people, you get a totally different seller because national association of realtors has done a very, very good job marketing that you need to have an agent to list your house and sell your property. There's a lot of people out there that think they have to have an agent to facilitate the transaction, even if they sell it off market. Got it. So you're hitting a different person. Like there's people that are more open to like that versus just like selling directly to an investor. Correct. They're like, Oh, like a realtor has somebody. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's just hitting, you're trying to like what you're doing with this and we'll keep going down the list of what we send is you're just trying to one, you're trying to time things really well. So the first letter is more of like, that's the letter they save and it's really gets their attention, right? That's the one they pin up on their, on their uh, fridge or, you know, I've had a lot of people pass away and then some, the personal representative will call us and be like, Hey, such and such saved your letter. No way. And so like this letter was saved, we're calling you and I'm the only person on there. So it's, but it takes, you know, some of those Two years later, three years later, it just takes like, a while. Why in the world are they saving your letters? I don't know. Some some marketing no, guys. I mean, but like, there's got to be some reason, right? Why it wasn't like everything else that they got? Well, because they really liked it. The marketing was really well done. It was very. They thought it was personalized because it was handwritten, and they're like, "I'm gonna need to sell eventually." I really like this guy's what he's selling. If I do get around to selling, this is the guy I would call. So I'm gonna save wow. it, and I, I want to remember this. Like older people. They use, they use handwritten notes. They, they save certain things that are important to them. They have paper documents. My, you know, my 91 year old grandma, she has all her banking, everything is in little manila folders. They don't keep it online. They don't know how to use it. They don't, they know, they don't want to use it. Like my grandma does barely use a cell phone, let alone the computer. Right. But they don't put it there. Like we put all our stuff online or we would search online. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so understanding that part of it. Then the next letter after that realtor letter would be an offer postcard. So open letter does a really good job. They have, you can send out offers and they'll basically have one, two, three, or four based on pricing, based on like how, how aggressive you want to be or how close to retail you want to be on the pricing. And you can select that. And then you can test, see what, like kind of how it shakes out. I usually do like the number twos, but it's actually say, Hey, Dan, you want a property at one, two, three main street. I would like to uh, buy that property. Here's kind of what we'd be willing to pay. So wow. that gets some people. Like, how's it pulling the data? Is it just kind of Zillow esque? Is it Zillow? Just it's just, like... it's just, it's as often as Zillow API. Probably they just tap into Zillow values. Yeah. And so they're just doing a percentage of Zillow. That's why you got to be careful because, like, so like if you're in San Francisco, right, you're not going to want to do the one that's like sixty percent of retail value because nobody's ever going to call you. You because you can pay up to like probably eighty percent of retail value and still make a lot of money, right? So you really have to understand your market and where your price points are. Yeah. But like, if you're in the Midwest, you need to be at like 50% of retail, probably. That's where they're buying these deals, right? So, yeah, exactly. So, and then, and then we just recycle, then we just go back through the cycle. And so we don't always do the number one all the time because that one doesn't need to be redone, but then we put them back on the cycle starting from number two. Okay. 
And then like, where are you getting like your data from? Like, where are you getting your list? Like, okay. So this is, this, this is the most important part. And we are in a world where people want to pull everything offline. Right. And so if everybody's pulling everything offline, then you're competing with everybody else. Your best list that you mail all to number ones, number ones get all, this is where all my number ones would go is your driving for dollars list. And if you can get, uh, which in California, I highly doubt you can get it tax delinquency records and layer it on with tax delinquency. That is your best list. Hands down. That's going to be the best list always because one it's self-built. And so most people don't want to do it, right? It's really hard and it takes time. And then number two is you literally, or somebody on your team put their eyes on it and know that that's a house that needs work. So you're not mixing in houses that might've been remodeled. They might be on our list that we pull, but they may be remodeled or maybe they're newer, they're updated. You literally know that if I want to buy rehabs, these all fit that box. And then while you're driving for dollars, you're also going to find my sniper sniper leads that I like to go after, which are like vacant properties, vacant, you want to find vacant properties uh, that, you know, have postings on the door, they maybe some boards up. And then those ones you write down and, and you, then you start going and doing like deep dive research. And just for an example on those, I'll give you two examples of things I've done before. One, I found a house had been vacant for seven years, followed up with a guy for a year and a half. He was in his almost eighties, him and his wife divorced. He hated her. And he felt, even though they own it since the seventies, that since it was his house before they got married, he should get all the money. But the divorce decree said, if he sold the house, they have to split it. So I got in touch with her again, she's older and her, their kids. I bought her half of the house before I bought his, no I bought 50% of her, her, I bought her interest for like $75,000. And so before I went, knowing that you would get a deal with this guy. Correct. I, 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 I had a, I knew I would get it. It just depended on how much I had to pay. So then I go back to him and say, okay, seller, I own the other half of this house. We're partners. I want to buy you out partner. Okay. Well, how much did you give to her? 75. Well, you better give me more than her. How about 80? Sounds good. Gosh. He just wanted to win. Right. And it was never going to work if they had to do it together because he had to split the money 50, 50. Yeah, $75,100. Yeah. Yeah, it was basically, yeah. Yeah, so another property that I've done, this is different, person that died, I tried to get in touch with the kids to see if they want to sell it. been sitting bigger for five years. They wanted nothing. And when I say kids, they're still in their 50s. They didn't want to talk to me. They wanted nothing to do with it. I went to my probate attorney and filed probate on this property. I had no, no interest, no nothing. Went and filed probate, became the personal representative of the state with limited powers. So everything had to be done by the book and my attorney. And so I got my appraisal to come in favorable and I paid and sold it to myself for appraised price. <laughs> what? Dude, I've never heard of that in my life. So those are your sniper leads that they take extra effort. You need, you need some deep dive skip tracing the software ability. You need to be a detective. You need to be able to get court records and understand that stuff. So we like, we have a good skip tracing thing. It's easyskiptrace.com. So E-A-Z-Y skip trace. It takes you to a people finders page, but we sell it and you get a better pricing with us. But then like, I can put your phone number, your name or the ad or the address of the property. And I can search that address of the property and find out anybody who's lived there, you know, but if I was going to go to, I could go to the assessor site first. Okay. Who's on record. Okay. Go research, put their name in there with that address. And you can do a bigger skip if you need to, like, where are they? Go door knock them, find these people. Okay. They're dead. Let's go to the next person. How do we do this? You have to understand, you have to understand chain of ownership of like when people die inheritance. So you have to understand the chain of the inheritance cycle because a lot of these people don't have a will. And so they don't have a will who gets it, right? That's, and so you got to understand that chain. I actually found a guy dead in his house. I didn't find, I had a guy door knock him down in uh, San Jose. So what? this guy owned like 20 properties up in Vancouver. They were shitholes. Couldn't get a hold of this guy ever. So I had somebody in San Jose, I paid somebody a hundred bucks on a site to go door knock. They're like, hey, something doesn't look right here. Welfare check, the guy had been dead in his house for three months. Come to find out he was like a recluse. I flew down there to try to figure it out. He had a family up in Vancouver and I tried to work him and they went with a freaking realtor. Like he would still be rotten in there. Freaking. But like I flew down there to go to the state and figure out all this all stuff. Right. And they found, they found their, I couldn't find his sister or brother because he had 
his sister, they found him. So their software is a little bit better than mine, but that's intense. That's like next level, like discovery. Yeah. So, so, and how I rank this stuff is like, like if I only want to flip like 20 houses a year, like 10 of those are going to come from my 10 or 15 of those are going to come from my direct mail. Let's say 10 are going to come from my direct mail. Five of those are going to come from five to seven of those are going to come from cold calling or not cold calling from like, yeah, cold calling, text messaging, online, stuff like that. Referrals. The two to three properties that I buy that I make the most money ever on are from sniper properties. That's the the vacants, the desk, all that stuff. They take a lot more time, but my margins are fat, 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 way fatter. But you have to understand so far from even like being considered on the market. They're not just like off market. They're like way, way off market. Right. Yeah. You mean like, correct. Yeah. So like the, we were talking about the 31 unit that I bought, that was a very sticky situation. That was like a Norman lead that we cold call, call the guy lived in Richland at the property. We got a hold of him. He's brother and sister hated each other. They hated each other. I talked to him, got him on board. He's like, good luck getting my brother and sister on board or whatever. I went to Seattle with, I was with my son, my three-year-old door knocked the sister handing them two packets here's our offer let's do this deal inked up you know took a while through the lawyers but they saw lawyers and lawyers suck everything. but like we had done our research on that property and on that person right so we knew i've seen the court records i knew they were fighting i knew there were his issues i know where they live i know what they do for a living i know how old she is so i know how to approach them the lady taught preschool i took my three-year-old with me that's amazing so now they're hard. It's hard to do this stuff. That's the thing. So you got to figure out like, who do you want to be, right? When you call this first, you wanted to get the cold call leads, which those leads work, but they take so many. They're not always going to be your home runs, but you're going to get deals. You're going to get listings. You're going to get things from them, right? And if you're building a good operation and you have sales guys and you have agents, you need to feed them leads. This is the best thing to do it. Cold calling and texting. But then you need to layer that because you'll get leads every day for them to work. But then you layer it with all these things. I talk about, it goes from machine gun marketing all the way down to my sniper marketing. So if I'm in Reading, I'm going to first build a driving for dollars list. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to build that list. And then what we're going to do after that, say you get in Reading, you have 95, 90,000 people. Let's say you get 4,000, four, three to 4,000 is probably what you'll get. I would guess. Someone, okay. I don't know Reading, but I would say so that's what you get. How are you building like the list? Like so it's you know? simple. It's time consuming. And my wife and I have done it. I hire people now, but you got to do it a little bit yourself. Yeah, I yeah. literally go print a Google maps off and you can probably be more tech savvy and have like my, my maps or whatever. And I download the driving for dollars app. I mean, it's just called the driving for dollars app. It's the most cost effective one out there. There's also the deal machine app, which is more yeah, expensive. Yeah. So, but there, there's two different reasons why I would, I would own both apps. The deal, the, the deal machine app is like, that's like your Mercedes or Maserati. They give you a ton of information. That's the one you want in your car when you're driving to a listing appointment. And you're like, I want to know about that house because that looks like really bad. Or I really want to own that property, right? That's a really good one because it gives you a lot more information right up front. Yeah. The driving for dollars. I've had that one for a while. I just, and it's been cool, but I just don't really have a system attached to using it. Yeah. It's just been like spread. Like I'll be driving, showing properties and I'm like, hey, that one looks like, Yep. I don't want to pursue. And so I pull it up, but like it's nothing that's consistent. Yeah. And it's going to be more expensive because they're more expensive to use. But then the driving for dollars app is like your F-150. That's just your everyday get it done. That's when you're going to go drive the whole area in, the, in two weeks. You or somebody else, you just drive, drop pins. When you get that information in there, then it will all, it'll come back and give you all the skip data or the names, all the records attached to it, the phone numbers, email addresses, if it has, it'll give you that basic skip package with that list. And so you go build that list, make sure you save it every day or make sure you save it. Cause sometimes you never want to lose your driving for dollars list. And I just take those Google maps that I printed out that have the streets on them that I can clearly see the streets and it's probably going to be like 15 of them. And I just take a pen and I just draw as I'm going through the streets and I don't miss anything. And it's easiest with two people. Huh? Now I don't know if do you have kids. Yeah. How old are your kids? Uh, six to 16. 16 year old driving. Yeah. Start this with your 16 year old, do it for a Saturday for like eight hours with a friend, have them bring a friend that they would want to do this with and have them build this list for you. That'd be kind of awesome. 
because you pay them $15 an hour or whatever, they can do it after school. It's easier with a friend because you don't want them doing too many things at once, but you're literally driving slow through neighborhoods and they're just, you need to show them what you want to write, what you want to write down. And so everybody's going to be a little bit different of what their quality of what kind of lead they want. So like, are you going to want to really beat up house? Or are you going to be like, I want a semi beat up house or like, so you have to explain to them like what you want on your list. Right. So you have to figure that out as well. Right. You can be too picky. And I, I would err on the side of caution of being too picky. Old windows. That's a good one. Yeah. Roof, bad roofs. Good. Yeah. Radio antenna in the car or not in the car, radio antenna on the back uh, roof. So like they do ham radio stuff. A radio antenna is like. Yeah. Cause that means they're older. Most, most people my age aren't going to ever do ham radio. Right. That's hilarious. So radio antenna, wheelchair ramps are good. Old Buicks or old, like Oldsmobiles or older cars. Also broken down cars and overgrown grass. Yeah. And then poor siding paint job. So like, I would say like, I'm, there's certain ones that I give like more value to. And as you start driving, you start to like get a gut feeling. So it's hard to always explain. And it's also going to change from area to area. Right. So like, say you're in like a D class area where you're like, it's just not a good area. I don't really want to own anything here unless I get a really good deal. Your criteria is going to be a lot harder of more things have to check the box in that area. Right. But if you're like in a gentrifying area where it's up and coming, you're going to have a lot less things that you're going to put on that criteria, like older windows, bad paint, and maybe a halfway, not good roof done writing that down or wheelchair ramp, older Buick in the front yard and maybe needs to be painted, I'm doing that, right? So that depends on the area that you're at. And so you have to make sure that you can understand. And, that's, and the other good thing about this is my, my wife and I always did it when we first started in new areas was because then I got a really good feel for the area. You don't need to because you're an agent. You've been doing this for yeah. everything front, back and forward. So you don't need yeah. that as well. You just need to teach your kid what you're looking for or whoever they're, if they want to do it. And then they just need to have a notepad to write down. They'll still put it on the list, but they need to write down the vacants, the ones that are like, this one checks every box. This one's vacant. Write this address down. So. Got it. And they just become ones that you like begin to pursue, begin to call and go through like that whole process. Those would be the ones you would, you would then do an easy skip trace.com and it's E-A-Z-Y. You would do that. You would do a, you would do a, research on them you do like the first skip it's like 70 cents you figure out like it springs back relatives all the addresses one do they live there and it says they live there obviously they don't because the house is vacant so let's go figure out where they do live if they says they live there and it's vacant very good possibility that they're dead because it doesn't show it shows a current address for them there if it's boarded up they're probably dead so like when you're building these lists before you begin to drive them I like your criteria. Like, what are you using for criteria? So you're not saying like non-owner occupied when you're building that list. Like, you're fine with them being occupied. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I buy stuff from owner rocks all the time. All the time. Yeah. I mean, especially in this this day and age. Like, now I have one rule of thumb that we always follow. Every seller gets treated like it's my grandma. I take care of my. She's 91. She's starting her dementia. She's starting to get dementia. And so everybody gets treated like it's my 91 year old grandma. So if there's somebody older, they're going to get a kid. I'm going to get call their kid and get them involved. But there's a, there is going to be a biggest wealth transfer ever happening right now between baby boomers to this current generation. There's a lot of older people that have been on fixed incomes that maybe need to go to a home or they need to downsize to an apartment or a condo that are living in a house that is not market ready because they haven't had the money to fix it up. Right. And so I go in there and say, first, you're my grandma in my head. If it can go listed on the market, push them to a listing. For and, sure. I, and I tend to go on a, appointments with two, two of us always, especially on the ones that are like, they can go both ways. And I'm, if I, I think they can go both ways, like wholesale or retail. I take two people, my partner and I go usually, or in Tri-City as an agent and I will go. I'm the one that's already built the rapport because I've been talking to them. So I go walk through the property with them, talk to them, figure out like one, what am I doing with this property? To, and then two, what is their mental capacity? Are they sharp? What do they really need to have happen? What are their goals? Blah, blah, blah. If they need to go, if they say they need the most amount of money and it's kind of borderline, it goes retail. 
Then I say, hey, this is my my partner. Um, he's also an agent. He brought some stuff over to you. I'd love to buy this house from you, but you can get the most amount of money selling it to him. Where it's an issue, if you go in there by yourself and you're the same, like, hey, I can list this. You might be able to do, do well at this, like go back. But they're going to look at you as like, A, was it, that was a bait and switch. And if you do two things, you're not really good at one thing. So I give the authority to, to the agent because now they're the expert. But if you want to sell your house cash, I'm the expert. Got it. Make sense? Yeah. So that's why I, I do that. Yeah. And that is a really fine line. And obviously like you want to do what's best for people and what they need, but sometimes like they really just want to be done or they don't want to deal with the hassle. Totally. Or, right. And so like I ran into this like about a couple weeks, week and a half ago or so. Like I talked to someone and they've actually done some like private money stuff for me, but, and they were like, Hey, we've got a rental. We just want to get rid of it. And I was like, but you're selling it for 30 to 45 under what it should be selling for. And she was like, I just want someone who can do cash and just like. Just Rentals are party. different. Rentals are a completely different story. And, but like, just kind of walking her through this, so like it eventually kind of came up that she already had two other projects that she was running. It was just something that was taking a mental space. It was too hard for her. And I was like, Hey, like, I don't, I mean, I said, I can try and make it work to buy this or bring an investor to buy this. I was like, but you're going to leave at least 30 K on the table. I was like, that's not worth it. I was like, why don't you just sell it? Cause it's ready. It has like a new roof, has new windows. Like it's in great condition. And I was like, there's no reason for you to do this. And she just didn't want to manage the projects for it. And I was like, I'll just manage it for you. There was like a couple things to do to fix it. And I was, I'll just help you. Perfect. And so the biggest thing people have to get out of their mind, my, my stepmom's my wife's uh, grandparents own the largest brokerage in Tri-Cities. My stepmom's been a broker at a different brokerage that's the biggest by volume, best brokerage. And I'm buddies with the owner there. But my stepmom would always ask, why the hell did this person sell you this house? <laughs> that's what they say all the time. They don't understand it. Because people will trade equity for ease of transaction every why? single day. I mean, I still don't understand it. I mean, like, I want to help people if that's what they want to do. But, like, I don't, I don't get it. Okay, so here, here's a quick scenario. I have a... $3.2 million deal closing in two weeks. I need a hundred thousand dollars today or I lose that deal. And I can make a million dollars on that deal. Let's say I'm going to take a fucking haircut to get the hundred thousand dollars to go buy that deal. And if I need it in two weeks, where else am I going to get it? Right. Or yeah. you're putting too much, you're putting too much value on money being the most important thing to people. Mental bandwidth. Like we talked about my mental capacity yeah. earlier. Right. Yeah. If I'm in a mentally bad spot and I just, this is making it worse. This is going to make me go to a bottle or go to put drugs in my nose. Right. Cause I just can't handle, I can't, I'm overwhelmed. Let's say, well, then I'm going to, I need to sell this and I don't really give a shit. Also people have money. People aren't poor. That's why I said on the older mm -hmm. person that's on a fixed income or that they're living in this property, you get kids involved. If they seem not all there, even if they're like over 75, you still get a kid involved. Hey, just touching base with you. Want to make sure you're good with this. I've lost out deals for five grand from doing that, but I slept really good at night. Right. Yeah, and we sure. always have a saying, if this got written up from their perspective and got put on the front page of the local newspaper, how would I look? And, and if it looks very bad, we don't do the deal. You know, we had a guy here in Tri-Cities that tied up a house for $80,000 with an old lady and threw a $60,000 assignment fee on it that would look really bad on the front page of the newspaper with an elderly, like 88 year old seller. The title company kicked him out. Actually it got, he didn't, wasn't able to close it because it looked so bad, but he was like willing the title to do company would even do like the wholesale deal or whatever. No, they doing. wouldn't close it. We're not doing this deal. You're, 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 that's fraud. You're stealing from this lady. Wow. So, but that gets written up on the front page of the paper. I'm going to get blackballed and, sh and shame. But now let's say it's a rental. There's a lot of older people that own two to five rentals, let's say. I mean, that's, that's where most of the rentals are held by guys like you and me. Everybody sees this stuff all the time about all the hedge funds are going to buy and all this stuff. They are, they're coming, but at this moment in time, it's still owned majorly high percentages by mom and pops. If it's a rental, I don't question why they're selling it unless they feel like, unless I feel like they're not mentally all there. That is you not my, you have a different approach for um, rentals versus owner right. occupants. Yeah. If I feel like this person has means and they know what they're doing in the real estate market, because most people don't sell a house ever. Like this old lady or old guy that's been living in this house for 45 years. When was the last time they bought or sold a house? 
They have no clue. They go off their tax assessment value. Most markets, that's way off. But this guy owns rentals, does real estate, has renters. They know what the hell they're doing. So if they throw out a price, and unless the house is in perfect condition, like you said, that one was, I'm going to be like, okay, let's, you know, if it's a good price, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to try to get as much money as I can. Because I still have to feed my family. I'm not a saint in the sense of like, it's not my job to tell that person that should have enough wherewithal to make a decision what they should sell me something for. That's not my job. But it is my job if it's my, if I treat them, if it's my grandma, that is my job as a decent human being. So basically all owner occupied, you're like, this is a grandma, this is my grandma and all of like the rental, rentals, income properties. You're like, you're a professional. You, you know what you're doing enough to make a decision and, and nobody's going to question that decision. Because if, if they went on the front page that the Columbia said, this gentleman sold a property to this gentleman for 50% of the market. Well, gentleman that sold it owns five rental properties. Everybody's gonna be like, well, that guy knows what he's doing. That's his fault. Right. So that's kind of the moral compass is like, if it goes public for you, like that's kind of where you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then we also don't push press on deals. So, okay. So we got that list. That's our driving for dollars. And then what we'll do is then if you want to send out more marketing, which I don't think you necessarily need to, if you have a good size driving for dollars, that's where you can do that you know, sniper cold calling stuff. Or you can also send out, which I'll tell you, don't let me forget offline, the, the letters, the handwritten, the first handwritten letter. If you're sending three to four or 5,000 of those out a month through that cycle, one, it's going to cost you three to 5,000, you know, dollars. You know, the first one's going to cost you double. And then you know, that's still a pretty big budget. You'll get responses. You'll talk to people and you're already busy doing brokerage stuff. You don't need any more leads coming in at that point. Once we start working through that list and we need more leads, then six months down the road, then we can start stacking other lists on top of it that we can go pull. Interesting. I mean, like for me, like one of the goals is really to pick up more and more rental properties as much as possible. We have really strong like demand for like uh, traveling nurses, like in our area. So yeah. there's a spot on the West side where there's, it's probably like five minutes from like two hospitals and there's probably three or four different pockets of like 1950s, 60s homes that are all within that kind of radius. Yeah. And so in my mind, like I really love to pick up a bunch of rentals, either single family or multifamilies in that area to really begin to do basically furnish rentals for these traveling nurses. Because the demand is really high and like the returns are really good. So Tucker, who started this podcast, also he's in, the, he runs the DFA, which I've been a member for ever. That'd be great. There's some guys in California, 200 bucks a month to talk to investors. It'd be a good program for you to jump in. But he's was an award building spec builder in Lake Oswego and only worked in like one zip code. Right. My buddy Greg, I was telling you about the builder in Kirkland and Fort Holmes. They only work in two zip codes, but only certain pockets in those zip codes. So wow. this strategy works really, really well. But we're going to kick off if you're only going to work in like four pockets and it's going to be different. We're going to change our amount of mailing or our different types of letters just a little bit. Okay. So we are going to go still with the first one. And still with the second and the third one, those are going to be there. Realtor letters still can work well. So I'm going to do the, probably do the first four. I'm going to kill the postcard. I'm going to kill the offer postcard. The next one, since you're probably only going to be working at like, I'm going to, you know, let's say five to 800 properties, maybe a thousand properties at most. I'm going to take, if you've gone through and done the effort to really figure out your Norman. So like, I really want, so you have four pockets. I really want these two pockets. Let's call them your Normans. What you can do, if you can get that list down enough, because this is time consuming, but you have a 16 year old, that's the key. You're gonna put your 16 year old to work on this. <laughs> You're gonna go through and build a spreadsheet with say 50 to hundred properties. And she's gonna send out 15 a month, but it's gonna be FedEx offers. You're gonna send them a physical letter in a FedEx envelope that they have to sign for with an offer. Dang, that's awesome. I, I have another thing I'll tell you about that as well when we get offline that I do. You know, because obviously there's guys that listen to my market that I do some of that stuff. So <laughs> I don't want to give it all, all away. So I'll, I'll tell you another thing that you can make that look really good as well. So the power, if you're going to go for three or four pockets is in the list. You should never, if you're doing this ever, ever pull a list. Only list you should pull is solds and maybe have a list to see how long they've owned it. Like pull a list to say who's owned properties from in these zip codes from 2017 to like say 2022 or whatever, we can pull that list and then you can scrub that against the list that you built. But if they look like crap, they probably own them for a while. Like I don't do that personally on mine, but you could do that. 
and then you can scrub them again, or you can scrub them against recently sold. Okay. Just to like clean up the list, just to like minimum, to like make it. You don't less. need a huge list. I mean, it goes back to like when I was talking earlier about my Normans, like say there's 500 Normans, there's probably, say there's 200 Normans in my market, right? And what I'm going after, I just need to be friends with 50 of them. And when I say friends, they're guys that I talk to and shoot the shit with. They might not be ready to sell right now, but they will sell, right? Especially in those pockets. You don't need to buy all these houses all at once. You need to go build relationships. So it also goes back to once I build a relationship and we talked about our giftology stuff, right? Then all of a sudden those guys start getting on the gift list. As you build a relationship, the gift increases, right? So it might be at the start. Hey, Dan, great talking to you, you know, over the last you know couple of months. Happy Easter. Hope it's well. You know, if they like coffee, here's a $10 Starbucks gift card because you found that out. If they have a big family, here's a $50 gift card to the local grocery store. I'll buy a nice holiday uh, Easter ham on me, right? Or I know you have some grandkids. Here's some stuff for the grandkids. I got them all $10 Amazon gift cards, right? Find out what pulls it, what is important to them. And that's where you give the gift is what's important. Family. So no, Gifts go in the order of emotional, right? So like that one with the guy that I sent the painting to, that's yeah. an emotional. Then wives, if they like their wife, oh right? Or they've been, you know, or they're married. Grandkids and then kids and then the seller, then the, then the person. Interesting. Because if you give stuff that's geared towards their wife, and they've talked about their wife, that means you've listened, right? And if you're good, if you've listened to them, that's somebody they can trust and do business with. If you've listened to them about their grandkids, that means you've really listened. And who doesn't love a good grandpa that loves his grandkids? That grandpa will do, they'll drive across the country. They'll drop everything and drive across the country for their grandkids, right? They might not do that for their wife, but they would do it for their grandkids. And they probably wouldn't do it for their kids because they're stubborn and say, you screwed up yourself. I'm not going to do, unless they're you know, younger. Right. But if they're older kids in their twenties, thirties or forties, they're going to say, you know, I'll help you maybe, but like you've been screwing up for six years. I'm not helping you. That, so you get what I'm saying? But grandkids are innocent. So that's, that's where they'll do anything for. That's interesting. So then you just build that list and you go be friends with 50 of these guys. Worst case, you're a freaking agent. You can list these things. Yeah. Best case, you can buy it. That's what I would do. Got it. So that's even Great. easier because if you only have the four pockets that you really want to focus on right now, start your kid off in that. And you know what? You and your kid could go do it on a weekend and it would be great bonding experience because it gets a little, oh, yeah. it gets a little tense and stressful, but it's also fun that you're doing together to show them and they're getting out of the house. I don't know what the 16 year old likes to do, but they're getting out of the house. You're doing something together. They're earning money because that's what they all want. And it can get a little tense because you're learning something new. So you can work through some of those, you know, more tense conversations. Got it. That's a great idea. Love it. So basically, like you're saying, like to actually like start this, like start with like easy, not with easy skip trace, but just like to find like the starting point for this list. Like, where is this starting at? This is starting at, you pick your three to four areas, you go print off Google Maps, you get the driving for dollars app and you get, get in the car with a notepad and your kid and those maps and you start driving. Got it. I, I, if you spend the next two months doing this, your money and your time is going to be so much better spent, in my opinion, than pulling, going pulling a, a list. Because they're all properties you're going to want to buy that need to sell to somebody like you. And that's if I was going to start over in a market, what I would do, if I was going to go to Reading and I would go do it, I'd go find a, an area like yours. I go drive for dollars and say I had 500 bucks. I go drive for dollars and then I would literally cold call all the worst houses. If I had no money, that's what I would do. And if I had a little bit of money, I would do my number one mailer. And if I had a little bit more money, I would do my number two mailer and, and with cold calling on all this stuff. And then okay. for yourself, you don't maybe need that leads manager we're talking about. If you only have two to 300, you take the best 50. You're got, you can get on the phone, you call them. Yeah. And the next thing is you don't need that leads manager because you only have so many people are going to you're not going to, they're not going to have enough leads to call you. Yeah. What's your thought about like VAs then? Like if I'm like trying to find like stuff for VAs to call, like 
I mean, this is an incredible idea. Like this is all really and obviously amazing. You totally know what you're doing. But like, if I also have like VAs calling, where would you recommend getting the data to give them the call? If that makes sense. Well, I can, we can pull the data for you. Okay. We can help you. I can hop on it and we can go to a map. We can pull the list. We can put the parameters in there. We can narrow it down. I'll help you narrow it down. And we can do another video on that another day because I can't stay too much longer. And then we can do a video on how we would do that. We talk about that. And then we then we can skip trace that for you. Got it. So, And then you can give them a list and you can hire that person I talked about, like that that mom. You could hire somebody. Like If you're just going to cold call, we can give you somebody that's going to be more of a leads manager cold caller that's more of a short-term, maybe a short-term deal. Maybe they work out as a VA, but they can do... Our leads managers are a little bit higher class and quality than our, our cold callers. Not that our cold callers aren't good, but they're just a little bit more competent because they have to work up and earn that level. So you get that person that's been there that they could pro- they can do more things too. They can do more tasks. They can do, you trust them more. They can be somebody you can build into your team and they're like 2,000 or 2,500 bucks. Or something like that. Got it. Depending on if they're working for 40 hours. So you can definitely do that. And both options are good, but like the guys that I've seen make the most amount of money in this business, in this off-market business, there's a lot of guys that make a ton of money with doing the machine gun stuff because they have a huge team, but they also have a huge overhead, right? And they have to buy deals. The guys that make the most money per deal and the, with the fattest margin are the Tucker Mary Hughes, which work in very few areas and they just work in certain pockets and they're very targeted about it. They don't do all this cold calling. They don't do the text messaging. They don't, you know, they might add in some ringless voicemail after their first letter drops to like, Hey, you know, whether on a job site, Hey, you know, I sent you a letter, but it's to a hundred people or 500 people. Right. Or my buddy, Greg, that's in a few pockets and two zip codes. You know, they're buying scream good deals, but they're very targeted and they go very, very deep. The other guys are going very, very wide in your size of market going and what you have going on, you probably want to go deep because you don't need to build an extra business and more overhead and more people to manage. You just want to go find some good rentals and yeah. go buy one or two or three of them a year. Then why would you put the headache to stress when you can just go farm 400 people and build a really good relationship with them in their mailbox? It's a really good question. Yeah. yeah. So it's really, who do you want to be when you grow up? Do I want to go build another team with people and headache and overhead and management issues when you're already stressed out about doing a one project yeah or do you want to go just just do it yourself and this is your thing that you can answer the phone you know whenever and you can do it with your kid or you can teach them you can do it with your wife it's kind of fun you have this certain area and you just know every person and like the normans that call me i know everything about their property i, I know everything because i've done the research i've looked at every single norman property so when they call me Norman calls me, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Because then it's just, confidence. yeah, then it builds confidence. He's gonna be like, this yeah. guy's legit. Yeah. So. Cool. Lots to digest here, man. Lots to process. Cool. I'll shoot you the recording if you want it. And then. Yeah, uh, for sure. Thanks for coming on. I think it's gonna be super helpful for our guests, uh, our listeners yeah. and people. And so. I appreciate your time. Yeah.